Hey folks, I'm Chris Thornton from Not School, and this is Tangential Consequences, a show about how tiny things can have big effects which no one could foresee. Also a show with a really long name, because you're smart. I want to start out talking about things moving in circles, and in science we can describe the way they move in circles using this equation. Wait, wait, come back. I promise I'm not going to get you to do very much with this equation. It's not as bad as it looks. The key thing here is this lowercase f. That means frequency. That's the frequency of rotation, or how quickly it goes round in a circle. You might talk about revolutions per minute. It's basically the same sort of thing. And so, if you're going round in a circle a lot faster, you get a higher frequency. The frequency here is squared. That capital F over there, that is the force on the object which is rotating. And you can see that it relates to the square of the frequency. So if you double the frequency, you get four times the force. If you triple it, you get nine times the force and so on. That's going to be really important to us shortly. But that's all you really need to know about this equation, that spinning things faster increases the force. Now there's all sorts of cases where this becomes important, but the one I'm going to focus on is in electrical generators. When an electrical generator spins to generate electricity, the frequency that it spins at, that determines the frequency of the mains electricity supplied by those generators. Now a hundred years or so ago, and this varies from country to country, but a hundred years or so ago, when people were first starting to standardise their electricity supplies, they had to choose a frequency here. So here in the UK we chose 50 Hz, that is rotating 50 times a second. In the US they chose 60 Hz. Rotating a little bit faster is a bit more efficient, but as we know, rotating faster also places more force on that rotor. It's much more difficult to build a rotor which is going to withstand the higher rotational speed and the higher rotational frequency. Uh, but it can be done. Getting up to about 60 Hz, that is really pushing the limit of what was possible with material science back then. But still reasonably fast. Today we could maybe go higher than that, we could maybe get up to 100 Hz or so, I'm not sure exactly. We could definitely go faster, but we're kind of stuck with these values now because we've built an entire infrastructure around these particular values. If you've ever bought an appliance in the US and tried to plug it in in the UK, you'll know that that really didn't work out very well, possibly after you called the fire brigade to put out the fire which you started. So we've got 50 Hz as our system in the UK. Now this causes a really interesting effect. You see, when you put a 50 Hz main supply through a light bulb, that light bulb starts to flicker. Our eyes don't respond fast enough. We can't see that flicker. But if you've got something which refreshes itself at a much faster rate, then you can start to detect that flicker. For example, a video camera. If you're in a TV studio and you are filming under lights which are flickering at 50 Hz, your camera can potentially pick that up. And so the cameras in early TV studios needed to be synchronised with mains frequency so that they didn't pick up the flicker of the lights. So in the US it had to be 60 Hz and in the UK it had to be 50 Hz. Now when they broadcast those TV signals, the way that a TV broadcast worked was it sent out a line of information and then another line of information and then another line of information and these were drawn one at a time by the cathode ray tube in an old TV set on the TV screen. A little bit like this. When they got to the bottom of the picture, like this, then it would go back up to the top and it would start redrawing again. This is known as refreshing the screen, and it's like a flick book. If you get a load of pictures, stationary pictures, but you flick through them quick enough, it looks like things are moving, and you all know that's how moving pictures in films and on TV work. That it's not actually that the pictures are moving, it's that they're refreshed so quickly that your eye detects it as movement. So the refresh rate of old TV screens was set by the rate at which those things were filmed, and the rate at which those things were filmed was determined by the mains frequency. So far, fine. No big deal, not a problem. In fact, if anything, this made things easier. When you were building your TV, you could use mains frequency to set the timing of the refresh rate. You didn't need to build a separate circuit that refreshed itself at 50 Hz, you could just take that from the mains, and it would work absolutely fine. But here's where things get a little bit more complicated. Because once we'd invented a way to record TV, 
And this, for those of you who are young enough and don't recognise what this is, this is a VHS player. We used to be able to record things on long spools of tape that were coated with magnetic particles. Way more inefficient than we can record things nowadays, and certainly not as adaptable as a DVD, or as easy to store, but these big blocky tapes, they were able to record the information off the TV in a VHS recorder. But the VHS recorder had to be synced with the mains frequency as well. So if you went to Florida and you'd visited Disney World and you'd been blown away by the magical kingdom that Walt Disney had created and you wanted to buy some of the merchandise and you went into the store to buy your Little Mermaid uh, VHS tape and then you brought it back to the UK, it wouldn't work. Your VHS player would be trying to read the information at a totally different frequency, it wouldn't sync up, and you wouldn't be able to play the thing, or at least you'd be able to put it in the machine and press play, but you wouldn't actually be able to get a picture out. This actually turned out to be pretty good for the studios, because if the videos which you could buy in the US were incompatible with the system in the UK, well then, you could release things in the US and not worry about the release in the UK. You could have separate release dates. You could release different material in different regions. And it actually worked out pretty well from a market marketing point of view. In fact, I can remember a time when things would be released in the US and it could be months before they were released in the UK, unlike now when all those release dates are pretty much synchronized. So it was a great system. It was so great that when DVDs were invented, the studios pressed for a recreation of this system. Even though there was no technical reason why it needed to happen anymore, because it was all digital, it didn't rely on mains frequency, the studio set up a system which meant that in the US you were in region 1. Here in the UK and in parts of Europe you were in region 2 and so on according to this map. Which meant that if you bought a DVD in Region 1, you couldn't actually play it in Region 2. Although, actually it was possible to get around that. But, in theory, and for most people, the DVDs couldn't be played in different regions. And this has continued with Blu-ray, and it's even continued with Netflix. For those of you who've been on Tumblr and you've talked to your American friends about things which are on Netflix, I'm sure that you've found out that we have a different selection here in the UK to people in the US. In fact, it's quite granular. Even between the US and Canada, they have a different selection of things on Netflix. And that is really interesting to me. Because it means that the videos that you can watch on Netflix and the shows that you can see on Netflix are limited and you can only see particular ones in an attempt to recreate the limitations of the VHS recording system which themselves were a consequence of how the video was taken in a video studio which all depended on how quickly the lights were fl flickering which itself depended on how quickly the rotor in a generator was turning in the power stations which itself all depended on this equation. And that was a tangential consequence. And I've got a lot more of these. Let me know if you liked this video down in the comments. You can follow me on Twitter here. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.